Hello friends and welcome to my June reading wrap up. Today we're going to be talking about and reviewing all of the books that I read in June. But first let's start with our stats. These come from the story graph. In June I read 13 books for a total of 3,747 pages which is about 288 pages per book on average. The main moods that I was reading was reflective, emotional, hopeful and adventurous. 60% of the books that I read were medium paced, 40% were fast paced and zero were slow paced. 54% of the books that I read were under 300 pages long. 38% were between 300 and 500 and 8% were over 500 pages. I think that's just one book. The vast majority of what I read, 85% was fiction and 15% was non-fiction. For the genres, I read an awful lot of fantasy. Six books that I read, the story graph is classifying as fantasy. Some of the other categories that the books that I read fell into were middle grade, children's, LGBTQIA+, young adult, contemporary, some science fiction and some graphic novels. 15% of the books that I read, I read entirely on audiobook. A lot of the other ones I sort of did a bit of a blended read. And I feel like I've had a pretty good reading month and I think that is reflected in my star ratings. My average star rating for the month is 3.77. And the majority of the books that I read were in the three to four star category. Now, as usual, we're gonna go through in star rating. So I'm basically gonna rank the books that I read in June and then give a bit of a review and my overall thoughts of the book as well. So before we get to ranking and reviewing the 13 books that I finished this month, let's talk about the book that I DNF'd. That is Together We Burn by Isabel Ibanez. This is a proof that I got through work. It's a YA fantasy new release. And I got 90 pages in before deciding to DNF this book. In this book, we meet 18 year old Zarella, who is the daughter of two people who own and run a Dragonador arena. Basically, this is kind of loosely based on bullfighting, except instead of bulls, the dragons. And Zarella's father is a Dragonador. His whole family for 500 years have been in this profession and basically he slaughters dragons in front of people for entertainment. She comes from a wealthy and highly respected family who have been doing this for 500 years. The beginning of the book is a pretty intense scene where everybody is gathered for one of these slaughtering events uh, and things go wrong and Zarella's mother is killed by a dragon. That all happens in the prologue. The first chapter is set a few years after that event and essentially a very similar thing happens. Some of the dragons kind of get out and they start killing people and her father this time is badly injured. And now it's up to Zarella to figure out why this has happened, who may be behind the sabotage and also to save her family from ruin and to save their arena. So an interesting setup, although I did find the way that dragons were used just for slaughter and for entertainment I found it really off-putting and then it doesn't take long before we find out that the main character is very much like pro the slaughter of dragons she describes them as cockroaches and like talks about the fact that if people like her father didn't slaughter them for money and entertainment then they would breed and like overrun the city and they'd basically be pests. There's also a moment where there's protesters outside the arena basically calling for the humane treatment of these dragons and to, for them to be released. And as the reader, I was like, yeah, I was on their side. So I was thinking that this was an opportunity for the author to talk about, I don't know, like some cultural legacy that was important. But instead our main character just is really snotty about the protesters. She's more annoyed than anything. I think she calls them self-righteous and like they don't understand anything. She's basically just really arrogant and entitled. But we are supposed to think of her as a nice person because she says please and thank you to her servants. I don't know, this just gave me bad vibes right from the beginning. I found it really uncomfortable to read. I found the main character insufferable. And there's just something about the way that the dragons were described as cockroaches, as pests, and the way that the main character was framed as if she was a good person, but I just couldn't personally see that. That made me just feel like whatever the author was trying to do, I wasn't getting along with. And so I decided to save myself some time and DNF it. Now let's talk about my two star book. And that is World of Wonders by Amy Nozuku Matatil. This was a book that we actually read over on my uh, Patreon with my Blossom Book Club. And this is one of the nonfiction titles that I've read this month. And this book is gorgeous. Like physically, it's a beautiful book. We have several full color illustrations throughout the book of different animals that the author is talking about. And this is one of those nature writing come memoir sort of books that I often really love. The book is split up into different essays that explore the topic of different animals or different plants. Uh, that the author has encountered and then she connects those to her own lived experiences. Most of the essays though were very short and so I often felt like those connections, those metaphors that were being developed 
often felt quite shallow or they just didn't go as far as I was hoping. The essays just kind of ended before I felt we really got to any meat. I was honestly really struggling to finish this. So about halfway through, I switched over to the audiobook and I did enjoy that a little bit more. The author actually narrates the audiobook herself and she has a beautiful, soothing voice that made it feel quite cozy to me. But overall, this did feel quite simplistic and shallow to me and it didn't go as far as I wanted it to with any of the essays. It's physically a beautiful book, but it just didn't hit the mark for me. The first is an audiobook that I got through Libro FM and it is Just By Looking At Him by Ryan O'Connell. I'd never heard of Ryan O'Connell before. I don't know if he's sort of a big name in the US or other parts of the world. And I don't know, although this was listed as fiction, it did feel fairly autobiographical. So I'm not sure if this is classed as autofiction or how much of it is fictionalized, but it's basically the story of a gay disabled man who is in a long-term relationship, but the sex in the relationship is a little bit stale. So, he, on a bit of a whim, hires a sex worker. And things really escalate from there. I personally found this to be quite a slog. I did not enjoy, I'd say, the first three quarters of this book. This is supposed to be funny, but a lot of the humor didn't work for me. And I think a big reason for that is because so much of the comedy is basically just about the main character or other characters kind of being terrible people. And to be fair, the main character is an asshole, partly because he is a bit of an asshole, but also because he is like literally drowning in self-hatred and in particular internalized ableism. I'm glad that I stuck with it because honestly, this was more like a one to two star read until that final quarter. When we finally got the protagonist like learning a little bit about himself and trying to make some progress in his life. I really enjoyed those lessons that he learnt, but that he also shared with us. And I found it honestly really quite moving. Basically, I just personally wish we'd spent a whole lot less time on the funny asshole stage and a lot more time with the growth and personal acceptance stage of the book. Next, we've got Navigating the Stars by Maria V. Snyder, which I got out from the library, so I don't have here to show you. I did read this book in a vlog that I did recently, so I'll leave a link to that in the cards above if you'd like to see me talk about this in a little bit more detail. This is a YA science fiction title featuring a young girl named Lyra who lives on a planet with her parents who are space archaeologists. It's set a few hundred years in the future and basically a bunch of the terracotta warriors from China have been discovered on different planets throughout the galaxy and Lyra's parents being archaeologists are working on the mystery of how these warriors came to these different planets and why. And at the beginning of the book, Lyra's parents have decided that they're going to go to a different planet where new warriors have just been discovered. And Lyra is really upset about this because of the time dilation. She knows that although the trip will only be about 90 days for her, her friends that she's leaving behind like years will have passed, decades will have passed for them by the time she arrives at the new planet. And so she and her friends literally conduct essentially a funeral for her because they know that they are basically saying goodbye and sort of holding on to friendships that will have such big time gaps is much more painful. So they just pretend that she's going to die. Honestly, this was my favorite part of the book, the first like 20%, because I personally found this idea of exploring this, this time dilation and like the, the realities of interstellar travel really interesting and like learning more about the impact that that would have on society and on human relationships. I thought that was hugely powerful. Once Lyra arrives on the new planet though, it turns into more of like a mystery and it's pretty intense. I don't want to give any spoilers, but I did quite enjoy reading this book. For me, it just never really exceeded my expectations. It never went in places that I wasn't expecting or that just really sort of blew me away. And on top of that, there is a romance that develops and I didn't really like the romance itself and several of the the small but stuck with me moments that just made me feel a bit uncomfortable and made this book feel a bit dated. Next, we've got The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes. This was a proof from work that I got and that I did also read in a reading vlog where I read five proofs for new and upcoming releases, which I'll leave a link to in the cards above for you. This is a really solid YA sapphic romance story featuring Yummy, whose family is Mexican. They're living in America, although her father was deported. So she and her younger brother live with her mum and her mum is hugely religious. She's very, very Catholic. And she puts an awful lot of pressure on Yummy to essentially be some kind of perfect role model to her brother. And anything that her brother does wrong or that goes wrong with her brother, their mother just b blames Yummy. At the beginning of the book, we're learning two things. One, that Yummy and her brother are both going to transfer to the local Catholic school. And because Yummy's mother only has enough money to really cover her brother's tuition and half of hers, 
she needs to work in order to pay her way. The other thing we're learning is that Yami is queer and her best friend at her old school found out about her being gay and she outed her. And so Yami is looking forward to going to a new school and leaving her terrible ex-best friend and their homophobia behind. And so Yami going to this new Catholic school has decided that she is going to pretend she's straight and she is going to let nobody know that she is gay. That is until she meets a girl who she starts to develop a pretty strong crush on. So there's an awful lot that Yummy is dealing with and some of it is quite emotional. There is also some pretty intense mental health and suicidal ideation representation here as well. And although the ending wrapped up very quickly and very neatly, I personally really enjoyed it. Next we've got Onyeka, which is a new middle fiction and it's the start of a new series. This is another proof that I read in my recent new and upcoming releases vlog. And in this we meet Nigerian British girl Onyeka who lives at home with her single mother, who is a bit of a helicopter parent. And she is best friends with a girl named Cheyenne. At the beginning of the book, Cheyenne is basically trying to talk Onyeka into coming to the pool with her for her birthday, even though both girls can't really swim. And at the pool, the worst does happen and Cheyenne is essentially drowning. And although Onyeka can't swim a whole lot better than Cheyenne can, she dives in after her in an attempt to rescue her. But just as when Onyeka thinks they're both going to drown, her hair, takes over and sort of saves them. And it turns out Onyeka has magical hair and her magical powers are very much tied to her emotional state and she doesn't really know how to control them. So her mother reveals the circumstances around why the two of them left Nigeria and came to England and why they left her father, who she's never met, behind. And she says it's time to go back to Nigeria to try and find him. So they head back to Nigeria to try and find Onyeka's father and Onyeka ends up in this kind of academy for superhero kids with a whole bunch of different powers. But all is not as it seems and there seems to be something fishy going on. So Onyeka and her friends have to figure out what's going on and save the day. Just like real superheroes. I loved reading this, especially the first three quarters of it. I just thought it was so solid and Onyeka is such a good character. I fell in love with her almost instantly. The ending did fall a little bit flat and I think I was mostly disappointed in part because I originally thought that this was a standalone, but knowing that it is the first in what is going to be a series, I do feel a little bit better about the ending now. I still don't think it was as explosive or as climactic as it could have been, but it has still left me desperate to find out what happens in book two. Now for my four star reads. The first four star I wanna talk about is also a new release that I read in the vlog and is also the beginning to a new series and that is Miss Mary Kate Martin's Guide to Monsters, The Wrath of the Willington Worm by Karen Foxley. It's a long title, but it's a really good book. This I would say is sort of like a crossover between junior and middle fiction. It's aimed for six to 10 year olds. And in this we follow Mary Kate, who is an anxious young girl and her mother, who is an archeologist as they go to a small town to investigate some mysterious occurrences. Basically there's some development happening which is putting at risk an old well that has been in the town for centuries and there is also some folklore attached to this well and a lot of the people in the town really strongly believe in it and they think that some of the stories from long gone past are starting to happen again so it's up to Mary Kate and her mother to figure out what's going on what's the truth of it what's false and to find a solution. So while Mary Kate's mum is off being like an archeologist, Mary Kate is at the library doing research and like going around and meeting people and interviewing them, trying to find out what's really going on. And it's a really cute, cozy little mystery that I really enjoyed. And what I really love in particular is Mary Kate. I think she's a great character. Like I said, she's quite an anxious girl. And I just really liked that inclusion and that representation. And on top of that, Karen Foxley's writing is great. I really enjoyed this. Next, we have a graphic novel, which is Feeling. A Story in Seasons by Manjit Thap. This was a very quick read because it actually does not have many words, but it's absolutely beautiful. And in it, this is one of my favorite pages, like sort of exploring the ups and downs of moods through a Snakes and Ladders board, amazing. Anyway, we basically follow Manjit as she takes us through a year in her life and the cycles of depression and anxiety and different moods that she experiences and how they are cyclical just like the seasons and how they are very much tied to her seasonal experience as well. And although it's dealing with what could be a more like, you know, heavy hitting, darker subject, and it is all very honest and real and raw, somehow through the artwork and the colors and the style, she managed to make it feel cozy and comforting instead. Next, I have another audiobook that I listened to this month, and that is Assembly by Natasha Brown. This was a very punchy literary novella that explored some really complex themes around race, class, misogyny, 
British colonialism through the lens of our unnamed narrator who is a black woman of Jamaican heritage come, who comes from a very working class family. But she has done literally everything right in order to rise through the ranks of British society. And it's written in a very sort of stream of consciousness way and yet it never feels meandering. It still feels so efficient. It's really cleverly done. And it's basically this woman talking about some of the things that she's currently experiencing with her white wealthy partner and also her recent diagnosis of cancer and reflecting on how all of these things sort of reinforce her experience of blackness, of womanhood and of class and how no matter how much she tries, she may gain some level of respect and success, but she'll never get access into like the upper echelons of society like she was promised. I especially love some of the conversations around like tokenism in this as well. I don't know, it's not really plot focused. It really is that stream of consciousness, but it explores some really incredibly powerful ideas. And like I said, although it's stream of consciousness, it's never, it doesn't like balloon out into some unreadable mess. It's really quite concise and I found it really quite powerful too. Next up we've got Wheeler, the Kuri Warrior Guardians, which is the first book in this new series by Jordan Gould and Richard Pritchard. This is a middle grade title and it is sort of like a, an historical fantasy based on indigenous stories and culture. We meet a young girl named Wheeler who is a really artistic girl and one day a bunch of dragons come and basically kidnap and capture everybody in her tribe except Wheeler and one other person. And Wheeler finds her grandmother, who is the Kuri warrior, dying after she's just tried to fight these dragons to protect her tribe. But obviously she's failed and her tribe has been kidnapped. And her last words to Wheeler are that she needs to find it in herself to become the next Kuri warrior to save their community. And so Wheeler basically goes on this quest to bring the four guardians together, which are like these megafauna creatures, so that they can fight the dragons and save her community. It's really quite action packed and fast paced, like a lot happens in this. And what I especially loved is just like the little droplets of information about indigenous culture that we get throughout the book. And throughout we get down down the bottom like an explanation of what some of the words that are included or names that are included might mean. And at the back there is a glossary with a pronunciation guide. And there's some really incredible illustrations throughout as well. It's quite funny at times too so it's just a great light-hearted adventure story featuring an amazing and memorable character. And this is another one that I'm just so excited to see where the series goes. Next is another graphic novel. This is Squire by Sarah Alfagi and Nadia Shamas. This is a proof that I got through work so mine is not all coloured although I did get a few pages at the beginning with the full colour and it's just beautiful. This is a really intense story and it captivated me literally from the first few pages. This is a fantasy story and in this we follow a young girl who is a member of an oppressed class in this society. But the army that is essentially oppressing her and her people have just opened up the call for anyone to join the army if they want to with promises of you know the people who really show talent and skill they can become squires. And so she develops a dream of joining the army and becoming a squire. At first her parents are very resistant, but eventually they relent and let her go. Although before she goes, her mother makes her promise to hide her identity so that she isn't discriminated against. I don't want to spoil it, so I won't talk about the story too much more, but I think you can sort of get an idea of where it might be going. And it's just incredible. It has a really strong message about complicity and doing what's right even when it's hard. There's a lot of action in here, but there's also a whole lot of heart and some really really warm moving friendships that develop. And as much as I loved it, the only reason I didn't give it five stars was because I do feel like the end was quite rushed. It didn't have as much space to breathe as the rest of the story did and I really do feel like that was a bit of a disservice to the book overall. This is the sort of story that I wanted to become a series. I wanted to have more of. It was so good. So while I do wish that ending was a little bit more fleshed out, we had a little bit more time with these characters and this world, overall I still think it's absolutely incredible and highly recommend it. So my third favourite book of the month was Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. This is a story based on the mid-autumn legend about the Chinese moon goddess. And we follow the story of Xing Yin, who is the daughter of the moon goddess. And the, the moon goddess has been exiled. She's like, she has to stay on the moon. She's not allowed to leave. But nobody knows that she has a daughter. And so when their secret is about to be uncovered, Xin Yin has to leave the moon and has to go down to live with the rest of the immortals. And while she keeps her identity a secret, she is determined to find a way to free her mother and to be reunited with her. And this is the story of her trying to do just that. And it's honestly quite fast paced. There's a whole lot that happens. 
I remember feeling like just from the first few chapters, like every single chapter, there was something substantial that moved the plot forward. And I remember thinking that like for another author, they would turn <laughs> like some of these sort of small arcs in the book, they would turn that into an entire book. There's a tournament, there's training, there's quests, there's romance. It's great. I'm not at all familiar with the legend of the moon goddess. So I don't know how much of this is inspired by the legend or how much is just fictionalized by the author. But I just found this such a captivating read. I read it so quickly. It was so fun and so good. It just felt like not a word was wasted. In a 500 page book, it felt like every word was justified. And I don't think I can say that about many 500 plus page books that I've read in my lifetime. So yeah, I really enjoyed it. I loved it. I can't wait for book two. Then my second favorite book of the month was The Lost Rue by Emmy Watanabe Cohen. And this is now my favorite middle fiction that I've ever read. June was a really good reading month. I feel like I found some really solid, like favorite of the year, favorite of all time books this month. This is a beautiful story. It's a middle fiction and it's sort of like an alternative history with fantasy set in about, I think the 1960s in Japan. And in this world, there used to be big dragons, like massive real life dragons. But at the end of World War II, they all disappeared. Dragons still do exist, but all of the dragons that are left are very small and then can fit in the palm of your hand. And most people have their own personal dragon, like our main character Kohei does have a little dragon who is with him all the time. Kohei though has a memory of these big dragons. It's a memory he shouldn't have because it's from a time before he was born, but he vividly remembers seeing his grandfather at the end of the war, looking up in the sky at what he thinks is a parade and looking up at the big dragons. And this memory really sort of inspires Kohei because his grandfather today is really quite a miserable man. He clearly has a lot of problems and maybe some PTSD. And Kohei really holds onto this memory and believes that if he can just find a big dragon again, that his grandfather will finally be happy again. So Kohei and his new friend Azoli go on this like little mission to try and find a big dragon. But instead of finding a big dragon, they end up uncovering a bunch of secrets that Kohei never knew about his family and about the history of Japan. So when I say this is fantasy, it's not some like high, like action packed fantasy novel, like a Harry Potter or a Percy Jackson. This instead is one of those really hard hitting, beautiful, emotional stories that deals with things like intergenerational trauma, but adds a magical element, in this case, dragons. And they're used as more of like an allegory or a metaphor for like allowing the reader to explore topics around intergenerational trauma, nationalism and national pride, healing and forgiveness. It's honestly just one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. I sobbed like a baby at the end of this, but it was like one of those cathartic sobs. I just felt so much for all of the characters in here, but I was also just so proud of Kohei. Like it's just gorgeous. And I've been recommending this nonstop to anyone who is interested in those more moving, beautiful kind of middle grade fiction stories. And then my favorite book of the month is A Psalm for the Wild Built by Becky Chambers. This is a very short book. I originally got it out from the library, but I loved it so much. I had to buy myself my own copy. This is also the first book in what is going to be a new series. I feel like a lot of these books are first books in new series. Apparently I'm going to have a lot of reading to do in the next year or two when all the sequels come out. Anyway, this is a science fiction novella, but it is very slice of life. And it's one of the coziest things I've ever read. In this, we meet a character named Dex, who is non-binary and goes by they, them pronouns. And they decide that they want to be a tea monk. And basically a tea monk is somebody who goes around different towns, offering the services of like just listening to people, holding space for them, listening to their problems, and then making them a custom cup of tea. It's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard. In this world though, we know that several hundred years ago, the robots that worked in all the factories gained sentience. And although the humans offered them personhood and let like offered to let them stay and sort of just be part of their society, the robots collectively decided that they just wanted to go to the wilderness and chill and figure themselves out and just experience life on their own terms. So humans and robots have had no contact for hundreds of years. But after a couple of years of being a tea monk, Dex is, I don't know, looking for a bit of spice, looking for a bit of spontaneity. And so they decide to just like wander off into the wilderness and see what happens. And they run into a robot, of course. This robot's name is Mosscap. And although they have a bit of a rocky start, these two just end up developing the weirdest and most wonderful friendship I've read in a long time. The book does explore some kind of high and mighty topics around mortality and morality, but it all does it in such a like grounded, cute, cozy way that I just found this one of the most affirming and heartwarming books I've ever read. It was funny, it was sweet, it was warm, it was just perfection. It was 
a warm cup of tea in a book. And I loved it. I cried, I laughed, I've read over some of my favourite passages many times already. This is absolutely a new favourite for me. I just loved it. This is another one of the books that I read in my recent library reading vlog. So if you'd like to hear me gush even more about this book, check out that video. But for now, suffice it to say that I just, I adored it. Okay, so that's it for June. Those are the 13 books and one DNF that I read in June. But anyway, that's enough of me talking. I would love to hear in the comments below how your reading month went in June. Let me know if you found a new favourite or if you found any books that you would love to recommend. Thank you if you made it all the way to the end of this video and a big thank you to my patrons over on Patreon and a especially big thank you goes to Livia, Lynette Brown, Laurie and Ian Yitzhak. That's all from me. I'll talk to you in the comments and in the next video. Until then, happy reading. Bye.